Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining our very first YouTube live session with the new community. In today's session, we will be discussing building your professional network and how to continue learning throughout your career as a compositor or as a visual effects artist. Um, please feel free to add your questions in the in the chat so we can answer them during the during the session. I can see some people are are doing it, so um, please feel free to do it. Uh, right, and now let's meet the panelists for today. So today we have with us uh, Joe Sparks, Tony Leons, and Adrian Cuello. Uh, I think I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, Tony, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, hey, everybody, I'm Tony Lyons, um, a lead compositor at Trixer in Munich, Germany, originally from the USA. Um, I think most people probably know me as a compositing mentor on my blog or YouTube. And uh, I've covered such things as like keying. Um, I'm recently doing some CG compositing. I'm also the creator of the Nuke Survival Toolkit. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Awesome. And I'm just Parks. I, I'm, a, uh, I'm a senior comper at Important Looking Pirates, uh, Stockholm. Um, previously, DNEG, MPC, and RLM. Alongside that, I also do a ton of training on my website, compositingpro.com. Uh, like seven years ago, I started a newsletter, which was a compost newsletter, just sharing kind of the best articles and tutorials I find on the internet. Um, and then I also run a website called nukecompostingtutorials.com, where we basically, me and a bunch of friends, just share the best tutorials we find on a website so it's easy for people to find. So I'm Adrian, Adrian Pollo. Adrian Pollo. Um, I'm an artist as well, longtime friend of Josh and, and Tony, by the way. Um, yeah, I've been working as a compositor for most of my career, uh, currently working as a visual effects supervisor and virtual production stuff, and at the same time teaching and kind of moving more towards education in, in a sense. But yeah, like my passion is always like lying on, on compositing and, and VFX in general. Um, so stuff I've made, I guess, tools, I've made lots of tools over the years and that's something I, I really like sharing and and I'm yeah recently starting to make courses, tutorials and stuff like that. So that's more or less me. Cool. Thank you very much, Ruben. Um before we go to the questions in the chat, because I think that we got a couple of them, but again, please feel free to keep us, uh, adding questions. Um I was wondering if you if you could tell us a little bit about how was your experience entering the world of visual effects and, and compositing, and if there is any kind of um, advice that you could share to those starting off. Tony, do you want to go? Me? Sure. Yeah, um, I think you just have to be really hungry for it. Like, uh, you have to kind of know that you want to do it. I mean, you, you find, you know, your interests, and uh, you, you kind of follow that. You got you to gotta always be searching for like tutorials or, or people that can that can guide you either paid or unpaid on, on YouTube or other sources. Um, you have to really ask uh, people that you're working with. Like uh, another very common thing is to jump into somebody else's work files and to yeah, try to ask every scene you can uh, when you're just starting out. And yeah, I'd say that's probably big advice. Just just lean on, on the seniors that are that are around you to try to learn more. I mean, I guess that's what working remote has kind of made a little trickier, right? Like it's hard to, you can still jump into other people's new scripts by opening them up, but there's less kind of, you're not sat next to a bunch of seniors or things anymore when you sign out. So it definitely makes it more tricky. Um, I think an another way to do it, what I used to do when I started MPC, uh, I think Adrian, you started MPC as well, right? Did you start MPC as well in London? Uh, it was my first kind of big studio. So the first time working with like actual com scripts that had a pipeline and, and a proper, you know, structure and... And actually, like Josh was sitting like next to me, so that was pretty pretty cool. There we go. We're stealing each other's knowledge. But I, I think I think like the thing is now you can just go on shotgun, and that's what I used to do when I was in the studio. Like I just go on shotgun, find the coolest shots, and uh, not even the shots that maybe like I'd be doing at a junior level. I'd just go nuts and just find like the super cool shots that maybe I'd be doing in like six, seven, eight years time, um, and just go through the new script. And then th there's kind of like two advantages to that, I guess. Like number one, you get to learn from that stuff, but half the time you're going to be looking at it going, I don't understand half of this stuff. And it's a bit of a mess. And now you've got some stuff to break down, but also it just is a great opportunity for you to then go over and ask the person who's actually done it and introduce yourself. So you kind of start building up your network a little bit that way and kind of have these impromptu mentors, I guess, in the workplace 
uh, as opposed to it being like a legit thought out thing. It's just you start making friends with people who are also better you at comping. Um, and I think that's kind of all our teaching styles as well, to be honest with you. I might add to that. It doesn't have to be like like a super senior. It can also be your peers around you. Like I was really lucky to graduate uh, university with like two really amazing comp friends that we, we both actually like moved from uh, Florida to Los Angeles together. And we were like sharing an apartment and we were just so hungry. And we, you know, we probably didn't know anything, but everything that we did learn, we would bounce off of each other. And uh, I think having mm -hmm. somebody like that, that's at your level or just slightly above, or you're both sort of pushing each other it, versus only relying on people that are, you know, seniors and stuff like that. It can be helpful as well. Yeah, I've been surprised personally by like, you know, when you take like an attitude of like iteratively just questioning everything and even the very basics and uh, just not taking for granted that you really know anything at all. Like reality is super complex and we are trying to emulate, you know, simplified versions of reality in a way. So whenever a model that works for you for one project or something, you, you think that's the correct way to do something. That's never the case. So there's like many other perspectives, many other things. And the only way really to, you know, keep developing yourself is, is, is to like be completely open and, and basically, yeah, no, no question is about question, I would say. So yeah, it's, a, mm. it's a super good point. Like, I, th I think I felt like a lot of people that I've come across, maybe they learn one technique and they're like, okay, great. Now I know it now. And then it's, it's the end of the story. But you should always say, oh, there must be a better way to do this. Or it must be, I must be able to do this faster or better or more creatively. Or, you know, like the, it never ends just when you, when you find one way. You should always be searching, as Adrian said, for, you know, a better way or, or maybe, maybe have an open mind to something better. Yeah, this is like one thing. The amount of times, right? You... Oh, sorry. Sorry, you go. No, no, you go, Adrian. You go. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying, like, like one of the really main things that made me fall in love with with compositing in general is the fact that we really have to know like a thousand ways to do every single thing and and the experience gives you you know kind of the intuition to which of them thousand is the, the best for a specific situation but the the way to learn the thousand things is to basically um get the time and, and especially in the first years when, when you're able to you know try and and do things wrong and there's not that much pressure in terms of you know delivery and stuff so just try and do stuff and, and just by trying yourself you will come up with new questions and and be able to you know um, keep developing a lot i mean i guess that's something as well right like if you're looking at someone's new script you don't know the context of why the decisions were made so it's kind of hard to like even though you can emulate the technique you don't know the context so again if you talk to them you could ask them why did you do this technique on this shot as opposed to this technique which i saw in someone else's new script because um, i think that's more of a senior way of looking at it I mean, the amount of people I see, like the biggest mistake I always see juniors make is they cram everything for an edge extend. And then, and like, maybe that's okay some of the time, but then, like, it's not great all the time. And, like, you end up having to fix it in tech checks. And if you only know one way of doing things, then you're just going to be cramming everything through that. And it just can be a nightmare. And it can, it's not enjoyable as well being a comper when you're in that situation, right? So I think the, I mean, when I teach comping, the best way of kind of the analogy I always use is like you're the worst builder in the world. And you wouldn't just turn up, if you're a builder, you wouldn't just turn up with like a hammer. You just turn up with as many tools as possible, right? Just in case. And it's exactly the same thing. And I think that's kind of the difference I'd say between like juniors to seniors. It's not even that they could, it's just the amount of techniques we can just iterate through before we we can find the best one base as opposed to kind of cramming everything through the same technique. No, um, yeah. Um. Sorry, I got a question. But actually, before I before I ask it, I just remind you guys, uh, anyone in the in the chat, feel free to ask any questions. We can do a, a Q and A. Actually, the whole the whole session is basically a Q and A. So feel free to add questions. But I got, um, I think that it was Tony who mentioned that he was like learning with with a lot of colleagues in in a flat, and kind of made me made me wonder like, um, are you still inspired? Are you are you still learning new things? And if so, is there anything that inspire you guys to? To learn new things, uh, do you go any place for specific information or, or resources? Um, yes, a question for everyone, really. Yeah, I'm, I'm always trying to learn new stuff, um, uh, and you, you kind of just search on all kinds of um, blogs and, and websites. Um, there's been some people that are sh that share like a bunch of uh, pre-saved blogs that they like. You know, a lot of the information that you find, like there, there's the obvious kind of places like Nukipedia or like the, the Facebook group or something or LinkedIn group. But a lot of the things you'll find is just like one blog that's off somewhere 
<laughs> like you never heard of, but it's been yeah, there from for 2010. 10 years. Oh my well. god! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or some forum that's existed since 2013 where they already solved your problem, and you kind of feel still like oh, shit. Um, but it, it, you know, there's all you save those, you bookmark those things, you can come back to them. Maybe maybe those things are at a level that you can't quite understand yet, and they'll make more sense in a, in a couple of years. So as long as you bookmark them, and always trying to, and, and then you share those with people. And uh, you ask people, hey, is there any place you you go for this? Um, you know that 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 you might be able to recommend me. Uh, Josh has a great newsletter. For I mean, that. that's kind of how it started, to be honest with you, because it's basically just I can literally just search the thing. If I get stuck on something at work, I can just search the thing for all the articles. Like that's how it started. It's basically for me, and then I just thought I'd share it with people. Um, I mean, something else in regards. Do, do, oh, sorry, you go from it. Do you find all those yourself, or do do people like actively um, give you links and stuff, and or, or is it you mostly searching? It's a combination of both. I mean, it, a lot of it, if I'm honest with you, is I'm on a job. I've searched for something online. Oh yeah, that fixed it. Great, I'll share it. Like, and then I've just got a list of all the stuff that I found. Uh, so like, sometimes a newsletter would just be, I don't know, like smart vector focus because then that was the issue I had that week or something. But most of the time, it's kind of me just finding stuff that I think is super useful and it's show specific. And then some people share it as well. It's kind of a combination. Um, but going back again to like what inspires you. Most of the time, it's just talking to people like Tony or like my mate. We've got a WhatsApp group with all those compass who started on the industry a while ago. The other day, for instance, he's at double negative and he was talking about how he used the copycat node to remove a key light. And he just did it like on a, in an actual plate and just like removed it, did a frame or to a pane and cropped in and then used the copycat. It's like, wow, I hadn't thought about using it like that. So the next day you try it out yourself and then ask questions. So it's kind of it's a very like natural process, I think. And it's one that you shouldn't. I think it, it's something that is kind of like a more like a way of life, if that makes sense, as opposed to like, right, I need to be searching on Google for everything. It's kind of like you don't really know where your next knowledge is going to come from. You just need to, you're just going to try and like absorb it and try and make the most of all the opportunities um, and continue again, just like set this framework of looking at other people's new scripts. How did they tackle the solution? I mean, I'm sure all of us free still do that. Like, I know I still do that. Um, so yeah, it's all the same stuff. Like all the same advice carries over, no matter if you're senior, middle, or junior, really. Yeah, I think that like the really important point is that you really enjoy it. You have to enjoy the process. That's like the mm -hmm. only way. And for me, like personally, like anytime I find like a challenge, something that gets me like, you know, a little bit out of the comfort zone, and and I try to, to like do a little research just on. So I tend to be focused on more like, okay, let's find the challenge. Let's find something that I want to solve now, and let's find what I need in order to solve that challenge. And, and that way, sometimes I end up finding rabbit holes and and maybe I just forget about the challenge and I just spend like the, the next year in, in one of those rabbit holes and it might be, you know, color science, it might be anything. And as long as you understand it and, and you know, enjoy it. And and then if you even have to teach it or, or present it to other people, that's also like another really big, you know, in conscious push to you trying to understand it consciously. And, and, and that's something like, you know, b both things I think like, Preparing for a challenge and teaching stuff. Those two things for me are like the, you know, really big uh, stuff. I, I think um, when you're working on a project, like naturally challenges will come up because everything, you know, it's it's either you haven't done it before or they want to see something brand new and exciting and you need to come up with these uh, solutions. And the way I kind of look at every task that I'm, I'm given is I'm, I try to be a doing it better than I did it in the past, or I'm trying to shave off something like, oh, I did this once before, but I'm sure there's a better way I can do it now. So like the challenge is like always trying to improve even on yourself. And like that's sort of the, it, it gives a little bit of value even when the task is boring because you're like, oh, I'm sure I can do this in a better way. And then you, you know, shave off a few minutes or, 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 or you now you have a template that you can do even faster the next, the next time. Um, so it's, it's always this sort of things like compounding, um, I don't know, comp compounding learning, I guess. Um, I, I see one question in the chat that I'm, that I'm curious about. Um, do you think there is value in switching between film, episodic and commercials in order to learn different skills? Absolutely. I think so. I think, I think, um, films allow you to, um, get the most that you, like the most accurate result so you take all the time you make it like pixel perfect but then you get a little bit slow perhaps um but working on commercials for example the like the entire commercial might take only uh one month or six weeks to do from start to finish so you have to be really fast so then you learn how to cheat 
and you learn how to do things that maybe are a little bit dirty, but the, those dirty techniques that are really fast can also be cleaned up into speedy techniques that can then be finaled. So it's not always about like, oh, we need to do this technically perfectly. So I think, I think learning in commercials uh, speed and in films like technically accurate stuff Good, good reason. I, I would say that there's also like value in not, not only switching between film and, and commercial, but also like between, you know, different studios, different teams, different, you know, environments, different projects. And and even for film in, in a local setting where you're working for a, you know, low budget client and and then you move to a, you know, a different project, but with a completely different budget and, and team, that, then there's like, you know, two completely different experiences and, and skill sets that you learn. I think. I mean, the amount of times, right, you work at one company and they're doing something one way and then you go to another one and because they're not doing it that way, you can just point out the obvious and be like, look, they do, look this company's literally just doing it this way. And it seems so obvious to you, but because they haven't they haven't obviously like ever seen that themselves, they don't know it exists. So I think, yeah, I think you're exactly right. Like moving around a lot. I mean, one thing I'd say is even if you aren't moving around a lot, you generally get freelancers moving around a lot. So even if you're at the same company, you can still get kind of like a new sense of new things that other companies are doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, commercials, not, like when I joined NPC Ads, it was crazy. It felt like I hadn't ever used Nuke in the way I was having to use it before. <laughs> it was like, it was insane. I remember I just did like some sort of like confetti particle simulation. It was like, okay, you've got an hour to do it because we've run out of money and we don't have money for a It's like, okay, let's just, and, and it is quite cool. I mean, it's a, it, I think they're very different experiences, right? And that, and that's kind of the thing. Like it, it reminds me of that, that like meme or that gif where it's like the, more time you have, like the more time you have to fuck around, the more you know. So it's basically that's it in terms of like film and ads. It's, uh, I think that yeah, I think there's like legitimacy for for both really. There, there was a there was a specific example I can think of. I think it was with Adrian. Adrian, do you remember this? Can Where you? we we had so we had a shot. Uh, we were both working at Trickster, Adrian and I, for for about a year, and there was a, a specific shot where. You know, there was some piece of the set that was left off on the on the screen right side or something, and we were like, "Oh no, how are we how are we gonna how are we gonna paint this out?" And it was kind of like a, a lower budget film, so it wasn't like a crazy big film. Um, and we were like, "Oh, it's gonna take ages to paint this out. We're gonna need a DMP." We're gonna... And I was, <laughs> you just take like a ramp and warp the image over and hide it. Like, hey, it's done. And like, <laughs> like yeah, a few minutes. We were trying to figure uh, out like it's... there's obviously with really complex techniques and tracking and stuff and vectors and. And Tony got like, you know, the dirty knife from his advertising days. And he was like, ah, you just, you know, push this. And, and it's sort of like a huge yeah, sequence. It's, it's a way of yeah. thinking, a way of thinking for sure. Um, I see another question in the chat that I'm curious about. That is from uh, Gonzalo. Uh, when, you, when you guys were juniors back in the day, what advice would have you given to yourself of the past, you know, as to come out of your comfort zone or just evolve as a professional? Hmm. I don't know. We've all done all right. <laughs> like, like, I don't know, because I'm just still doing the same stuff that I was doing then. I think we all are. Like, we're all just like still super hungry. And I, I'm actually, I guess one the bit that I would give myself is when I started out, I was trying to like make my first like versions of a shot finalable straight from the start. I was like, right, I'm going to bash this and all together and really make it look as kind of like cool as I can. It's going to be a version one final. And that's like the dumbest thing to do. Because now the VFX supervisor never knows actually what the lighting looks like. So like half the time the lighters are doing little cheats and little comp to kind of sell their lighting. And uh, and actually generally you just want to do like a first take uh, and not push it too far just to kind of, so you can go and stay these and ask any questions you've got about the shot. So I guess that would be the, the main bit of advice. But again, like I think that everyone's going to make that mistake. And I would much rather that I would have been super keen and like been doing that than I felt like I, I wasn't pushing myself, I guess. But yeah, I think that's something that I can, guess comes from maturity. Like you, you can just calm down a bit and just like slow down the process a little so that you're asking those questions. Um, so yeah, that'd be probably mine. I would say like try to understand every single thing and that will take time, but just like do not think that just because you know, you know, in which order to press three buttons, that's like something you should mm. just take for granted. Like you just question every single part. Uh, I know I'm probably repeating that, but it's like, you know, the main thing that made me learn. Yeah. Is that like a Elon Musk first principle kind of thing, Adrian? It's like breaking it down to the smallest component and trying to understand each little bit of it. Yeah. 
Yeah, Adrian I, I uses was... expression notes for everything, man. That's all he does. He doesn't use any other notes except from expression notes. So that's blink, how he comes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I would say, um, oh, like learn the fundamentals and and don't treat them as when you're first starting out. So I, I, I started doing roto roto and prep or roto and paint um, at Luma Pictures, and I was doing that for roughly two years, and I think that's a lot of that's a thing. People just want to rush through. Ah, I just want to become a comper. I'm just going to do it. But I was like, no, I want to be like the best at this so that I can know like once I move on from this, that I have a solid like base. And there's a lot of these like fundamentals like that are not very fun, like keying or, or roto or prep or something like that, that maybe people find boring. But that's part of your like arsenal of tools that you should be using later on. And, you know, a senior that can also dive in and do like a really good prep really fast and really accurately is is you know that's that's makes him uh, or him or her better than than uh, a senior that just skipped that uh, phase of their life or something and just went straight from university to to comping or something i guess one other thing as well actually just quickly like um as a junior i think there's a lot of and like the, um sebastian shit the split the diff guy mentioned this like uh as a junior um i think you focus a lot on kind of the instances of like how does this particular node work which is super super valid but at the same time i think as you progress through the ranks and you just kind of know new obviously there's still stuff to learn but you kind of know how to do most things now obviously there's new techniques but you know how to do most stuff you then start caring oh shit i've got to make a good looking image like that's actually the job right and i think i i wish i'd kind of put learned more about that because i think my friends who i'd say have got a better eye than me are the ones that focused on that more like maybe they studied photography and, and that kind of side of things and i think that as well is something that again i understand why people kind of just focus on learning the software at the start because that makes complete sense but at some point like you're going to get paid to have make a good looking image and not because you necessarily know this bit of software um and i think that's another thing that you could start focusing on as well when you go into people's scripts ask yourself why is this a cool shot what is it about it that the compositor's done vis the lighting that makes it a cool shot um so that'd be something else i'd try and focus on as well um, there, there are a few questions regarding AI, so I'm just going to go for the first one. Uh, what role do you see AI playing in the VFX pipeline in the next few years? Adrian might be the Adrian closest to this with this virtual yeah. version. I don't know. I, I, I can see many for sure, and I'm sure uh, we cannot see. Like, we are just starting to see so many, you know, new things that. We're like cooking in the background for many years, and now they're like boom, and 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 now you can speak to a you know a chat and, and stuff like that. So uh, I think one one thing about VFX for sure is that we do not build bridges, we do not make you know buildings and stuff like that. So AI is really good at doing things almost correctly, and I guess this is an industry where you can do many things almost correctly. So um, as long as it works, as long as it you know uh, it might be that at least in the first stages, like many um, tedious processes can, can become a little bit, you know, automated. And I mean, that this is like a topic for, for a really uh, long conversation, I think. Yeah, I think, I think there was a specific question about like uh, generative AI. Um, and like uh, mm. we were sort of speaking about, yeah, when you, when you can just uh, look up a texture or not, not look up, but invent a texture, like, oh, I need some metal scratches or something. And instead of trying to Google or, or Shutterstock it or something like that, you can um, actually generate some cool textures that are very specific and that you can use or stock, stock footage maybe one day that it will be like, oh, here's an explosion that's unique to any other explosion. I think that day probably will come and that'll be just another tool. It'll, it'll be really cool to use that stuff. I mean, I think also like no one knows it, right? Like again, most companies I'd say are playing around with it a little bit, but because the VFX is so slammed and there's a shortage of people already, given like the amount of work, I think if I'm honest with you, again, they haven't got enough time right now to play around with it. Um, so I think it'll be a slower transition than most people think. Then I think it only takes a few people to kind of come up with some clever techniques and workflows. And then those people leave to move to another company and then the knowledge kind of disperses. That it will take off but i think it will go kind of slow and then suddenly it will just uh, be be being used for a whole bunch of stuff um again like i know that like key light method and, and tony said like with the stop footage i think that'd be pretty great um yeah i mean i think it, it's gonna be i think again like no one fully knows how it's gonna get used yet obviously everyone's using it for images at the moment but i never thought i could go on chat gpt and use it to kick out nuke python for me that's not like that's so useful 
in yeah. itself, right? So like, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we could never have predicted. And I think it's going to be the same with this as well. Like, obviously, everyone's thinking about concept art. But I think that's, it's kind of too easy. Obviously. Like, it's just too obvious, if that makes sense. There's going to be some way better ones than that. I mean, and there's like, you're just going away from, you know, generative for a second. So there's like already lots of stuff getting used actively in many companies. Like, for instance, like, there's many studios doing uh, denoising using machine learning. Uh, copycat is used everywhere. Like, uh, at least in Orca, we used it a lot in, in the last three projects. And, and it got us like so much work out. Um, I mean, there, actually, I, another one we sorry, sorry, yeah. Jim, you go for it. I don't know. I was just like going to uh, nerves as well. That's like a really big one that will come uh, very soon, like neural uh, radiance fields. So I can I can see like how in a very, very short period of time, we will be able to, you know, render an environment from Nuke as a sort of delegate scanline render, which, yeah, I mean, there's so many things. And it's so interesting that you could just spend like years on a single one of them. So. I mean, another thing as well is at RLP, we've got a guy who runs a company called Pixel Mania, and he's focused on, he's a VFX soup and compa, and he does machine learning tools now. And so today, for instance, I had a shot with it, had a repo. So we changed the, the whole camera move. And the motion blur is obviously going the opposite way because the camera is moving in a different way in the plate. So we, we've got a D blur node, basically, and it fixed it all. It's nuts. So I think, again, you're going to see it in these more obvious routes. And then I think you'll slowly see whole workflows and pipelines go. But, and I think actually that's the advantage of a medium, small size companies at the moment. You're going to start seeing like those companies being able to hit way heavier than the big companies because the big companies, their pipelines are way more locked down and they're more like pace based on legacy stuff. Where I know there's a company in the UK that was VFX company that was built by a guy who's very good at deep fake stuff. And he's hiring some comps from ILM and some other stuff. And they're just focusing on that kind of stuff like de-aging and things. And I think you're going to start seeing like, you're going to start seeing YouTubers being able to hit knock stuff out that's as good as like whole massive companies, mostly because their process is just going to be more efficient. Like they're the client and they can kick that stuff out. And I think you're going to start seeing that kind of more and more. Um, so yeah, I think the small, medium-sized companies are more flexible and they can tackle problems in kind of quicker ways. So I think they're going to be the ones we see most of the innovation personally. Yeah, that could be another thing with uh, that commercials versus uh, television versus films thing too, where on a commercial, they could be like, oh yeah, well, this will, we can just try whatever because six weeks, and also you can iterate on workflow and your technique because you do a project and then six uh, weeks later, you're on a different project and you're like, well, that didn't work. So let's try a different thing. Uh, whereas like films could take a year, could take a year and a half or so. And so, so it takes longer um for, the, for those workflows to be kind of tuned in. Yeah. I mean, I guess actually, Adrian, like for you, like you learned a new technology, right? With the virtual production. How did you, how did you do that? Because you've gone from being a senior composer like me and Tony to now being ridiculously fucking good at virtual production. So how did you do that? Because obviously around these new new emerging technologies, there's less of a community already. Totally. Like that was like a completely unexpected one, actually. Uh, I, I just joined like this company, Orca Studios, where I'm working at the moment as a comp supervisor. Oh. I was just going mm. to do VFX stuff, as usual. Uh, then the, the pandemic happened. Uh, we had like all the virtual production stuff going on in the background uh, with you know game developers mostly. And and the, the cool thing here was that we found that actually the the best profile that we had for supervising this kind of uh, shootings uh, was mine because of the compositing background, especially, and, and not for anything else. Like, we what, is it, what is it in compositors that's so useful? Sorry, you might be not. Yeah, yeah no. Um, so. Like, like the thing is, on, on a stage, on a virtual production stage, um, we as compositors are like in the in that part of VFX, I guess, where we have to know about uh, color, image, uh, formats, mm -hmm. projections, cameras, lenses, sensors, all of that. And a virtual production stage is literally a live compositing, I would say. So, so you really need the uh, you know um, the DOP, like the director of photography, just understanding where to put lights and stuff. But you really need the comp uh, profile there in order to um, you know gain yeah. up. You know, there's like many concepts. Like, you have to understand that a project 3D in, in New York is just like a camera and, and a geometry that you, you map an image onto. And, and all of those concepts, it was like, hey, they just came natural to me because of my comp experience. So that's kind of how I, you know, started with this. And then we found out there was lots of things that nobody had done. So we had to like figure out <laughs> at least a temporary way, at least a way to get started. And, and that opened like mm -hmm. so many rabbit holes. Um, because when I was but did you learn it all on the job from people at work, or did you try stuff out at home first, like with small productions? Or so I think. <laughs> uh, so but maybe we started from the ground up. I would say, like, okay, let's. What what are the basic pieces that 
we need in order to make this work. Uh, and it's like, okay, would this work like this? And you just put some pieces in order to see if, if, if it doesn't you know, fall uh, on its weight. It's like, okay, more or less works. Let's try some commercial. <laughs> uh, and then we, it's like, yeah, you, you know the color is not exactly as we intended. It's like, yeah, but is it a matter of saturation? What is it? I don't know. So, so that started like opening some boxes, and and if you really aim for film and and you aim for like high high quality stuff, then you really have to find the way. And and just by what Tony was saying, really like going to the basics and then building again from the, from there. Uh, there's information and everything. Just if this mm -hmm. is something new, you just need to go to the basics of the information that will allow you to then build this new thing. But it's already based on you know. Um, I, I don't know. That's Adrian, did the, does it go both ways too? Like when you were learning the virtual production stuff, were you like, oh, there's some stuff here that I could could have brought back to comp or I could still bring back to comp? But did it go kind of both ways? Yeah, especially like in virtual production, like things that are related to, you know, uh, live metadata on the camera, like uh, lens distortion, live uh, tracking data. So all of that, like, just like feeding it into the uh, raw files and then just bringing it into Nuke or if we start using Unreal Engine uh, on the stage, then if we have Unreal Engine and we have the camera tracking data, can we just replicate that background in Nuke? And, and then you, you find out that, hey, maybe there's a delay in the system, so I need a time offset in the projection. And, and then you, you know, there's like, anytime I guess you, you open a new box, uh, there's some connections it has to your existing boxes that you weren't aware of. And, and I think that's so. Uh, it doesn't matter what the technology, then you're still going to have to hack it in comp. Is that what you're saying, Adrian? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yes. <laughs> it could totally uh, end up there. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just going to interrupt just to um, answer a few other questions from the chat. Uh, feel free to to answer any other if you if you feel like. Yeah, oh, yeah, there is one question great. that you really want to, but I see one that is about uh, lights. Uh, can you throw some lights? Sorry, photography. Can you uh, can you throw some light on how photography is helpful in terms of understanding lights, shadows, textures, and compositing? Oh my god! I mean, because that's basically what you're trying to recreate. I mean, that's uh, everything. I mean, actually, no. The best person to look at this. There's a comp, and I think he's probably got the best eye as a comper in the industry, he's called Miguel Santana da Silva. Yeah. Look at that guy's Instagram, go on his Instagram. He's an amazing photographer. And then he designed the, um, I mean, obviously there are other people involved as well, but he was definitely a big part in designing those amazing shots in Batman with like the like magic hour, sunset -y, um city shots of Batman. And it's his bloody style. Like it's actually his style. Um, and another guy to look at for that is like Dan Kemis as well, who's a really good photographer did a bunch of stuff like videos for National Geographic and things. Um, and he's a really good comp at ILM as well. And so is Miguel. So it's like, I think I think you start realizing that, oh, look, if I adjust the f-stop, then this happens to the defocus. And and you're, you're not even going to be doing it. You're not going to be going, oh, today I'm going to adjust the f-stop and see what that does. No, no, no. You're just going out there and you're slowly just going to be learning stuff without even realizing you're learning it, I think. Um, I mean, you can do it with your phone and, and whatever, just kind of the biggest thing for me that I started appreciating, I believe too late in my career was underexposing and overexposing. Like on, on Jungle Book, John Favreau was saying like most shots are 30% underexposed and 30% overexposed. And I always kind of like try and bear that in mind now when I'm working on stuff. And exposure is a big deal. Like for instance, if you're working on a shot that's in a room, maybe the window's blown out now, right? And that's the problem. Like a lot of the mistakes I see compers make is all their shots look like HDRI images, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see the detail and everything. Um, so yeah, that, that's what you'll learn as with, with photography. Yeah, like knowing knowing where the imperfections of the image are, because the imperfections, as much as people want to get rid of them on the on the film side, uh, that's the stuff that we add in to make it look like film. Uh, and knowing like, oh, like one of my favorite things, I don't kill anybody is lens flares, but not, not any lens flare, but when a, when a light goes right off the camera, and it you can no longer see it and it takes like a second and then suddenly there's like a bloom and i just love that and it's like something you can only see by looking at actual uh like video of lights that are that have just gone off the camera and then it, it then it blooms and it's seeing all these like little imperfections and these little hellation where the the glows sort of a blow uh, the the highlights glow a little bit and trying to replicate all these little little things that the camera's doing um that's all that's going to sell all the realism and stuff to to your shots there's like a 
a really big component of just like you know being a student of the world like and just going out and be like hey look at like how, how the you know the light is, is reflecting on, on this on this water but here i can see more of the, the reflection there i can see less of the reflection and why is this and uh oh look at that light it may be bound from the from the ground or whatever and and, and that like opens like a way of looking at things i think that you really need if you, if you want to you know progress and and there's like that combination of of the purely artistic and creative things but the purely artistic and creative things if you want it to make it work it needs a super solid technical background and with mm. technical i'm not saying blink script with technical i'm saying understanding light understanding uh materials and, and all of that is, is so important because that's in the end what we are trying to replicate right I think yeah. to, going back to what Tony was saying as well, just quickly about the light coming out. Uh, there's a guy called Chris Turner, who's another really good compositor. His blog has actually got a tool to do that. So when the light goes out, it pings out. Uh, mm. So that'd be worth, if you want to recreate that, his yeah, uh, blog's looking. really good, Chris Turner. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And just knowing, you know, like, yeah, all the, all the fundamentals of the camera, as Adrian was saying, of, of just like, um, one, one of the cool things that I learned uh, recently, which I, I feel stupid saying, but it, it's, um, when you change the, um, oh God, I'm, I'm blanking right now. Well, the, the scale is the same as the um, the focal length. Sorry. So if you double the focal length, it's literally like zooming the image in. But it's like like um, a 25 a uh, 25 mill millimeter lens is uh, twice as small as a 50. I think it's what it was, or twice as big rather. Um, but anyways, it's knowing these kind of like technical things can kind of help you, and and knowing like what the camera would do. Um, in uh, especially stuff like the depth of field as well. That's something that people really struggle with. Mm -hmm. Is like, yeah, study some macro photography and stuff because, um, you know, there's like a limit to how much things blur, and there's there's like, um, uh, distances and, and just just seeing images and playing with it with a camera and being like, oh, this is the like focal distance here, and, and that that would really help your understanding with uh, some of these creative shots, some macro ones. Mm -hmm. For virtual production, it's so important to like really learn about sensors and and all of those like metrics because it's like where all the doubts really tend to come from. Yeah, crazy stuff. Okay. Oh yeah, someone asked for the the Insta handles. Uh, it's Miguel Santander Silva. If you just search that and the Dan Kemis, which is Dan and then K E M E Y S. Those are the. So, I mean, there's a ton of other good photographers as well, but like those are the two that really stand out for me. Their videos are amazing, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Learn yeah. so much from them. I mean, that's actually something I do. So when I have to look, develop something, I will literally go on Instagram and find, I've got a ton of photographers that I follow and uh, same on like Behance and things. And if I have to look, develop something like for a sequence or something, I'll find photographers that have taken photos very similar to the look that the client wants. Like on Slumberland, I had to do this super like snowy, stormy look. And there's a few really good photographers that kind of did that in their photography. And at least then you got like something to point to, right? The worst thing in the world is being a comparer and you just kind of, oh, I've got to kind of come up with it in my head. So I think yeah, that, that's super valid as well. Like not just having people you look up to in terms of their technical ability, but also in terms of their eye um, as well. And that, that your, their eye can be everything, if that makes sense. Like it could be chefs or, 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 uh, or photographers or artists or painters or whatever it is. Um, and you can use all of that in your work as well. Cool. Thanks. Um, I was thinking about switching towards Python because I see that there are a few questions about um, how you how useful is Python or, or programming in the industry. Um, there were also some references about the some courses that I think that Adrian um, uh, has about about that. I don't know if you guys want to comment anything. I mean, I guess I can comment something. So. Um, yeah, one thing I really enjoy is teaching, and um, one of the main reasons I, I came back to Spain was to be able to teach like in-person groups, and and I've been like directing a master's in compositing for four years at the moment. So I I felt like ah, this is great, like wow, oh, I did such a nice class today, and and but it's like gone. So so I I started thinking like let let's try to you know uh, record something and do uh, that's, that's why. I, started doing some courses now and offline and stuff. But just going, um, yeah, on my website, I have a, a course, a first course is, is now published, it's about Python, actually. I think it's really, I think it's useful. I mean, it was very useful for me, but I also have done tools, which is not an integral part of compositing, but just being able to think in that way and at least do basic stuff, 
I think whenever you face as an artist the you know anything that is either boring or you have to do many times or um or there's a way that other people will need to do something very similar and and you can like separate it into simple instructions it, it can be like a nice a nice opportunity i think and, and not just for that but python is like at the moment it's like um a very high level language meaning it's pretty close to how we speak so it's pretty popular and i think it's like one of the main things that will be used for everything that's coming in terms of machine learning and well and yeah pytorch right i was going to say like yep. if you want to get into machine learning then pytorch like python's super useful for learning pytorch and stuff and then you can train your own stuff and then convert them to cat files and things but i think one thing one thing i'd say for python i don't think it's necessarily it's a nice to have like for me personally i always know i always have go between kind of being technical and creative and like there's people i look up to in terms of like even adrian's one of these people who's like way more technical than me and it's like if when i work with people like that i'm like oh this is pretty hype like i'm gonna make my own tools and start like doing some python stuff and then i work with people like miguel and i'm like oh screw learning python i'm gonna get more into <laughs> photography and all this stuff right so yeah. and i think there's all sorts of different compas like in the actual industry in terms of senior lead vfx soups that range on that scale so i think it's one of those things that i personally wouldn't ever suggest you like force yourself to learn it because and you hate it and all this stuff but at the same time yeah it's a really useful skill and again it's kind of like coming back to that time when i was saying how if you know one technique you're going to force everything through that i because i'm not so i'm kind of okay at python but not great and if i was better i'd probably find more uses for it right so again it's you don't see the opportunities until you actually get a little bit good at it but it's definitely worth learning uh, ben McEwen also did a, a kind of i don't know if it's nuke related or if it's just python in general but but he did a course as well that was a python for um, a comp yeah i think yeah, i hmm. downloaded that one and uh it's great um yeah i learned a lot from that as well um i i would say you know when you're as far as like tools and python and stuff when you're a junior you sort of don't know anything you're like okay mm -hmm. is this good tool is it is it a crappy tool what is it when you're when you're a mid and when you're a senior then you learn all the good stuff you're like oh this one is better than the other one because it gives a better result it's faster or whatever it's more technical there comes a point where that good tool probably won't be you want it to do something else and you want it to be, there needs to be an additional thing for your specific project and where the Python and where, where all this like technical learning, then you can make the tool for yourself and you can make it do whatever you want to do. And then you reach this sort of like higher, like a TD level or a super senior level where it, you're, you're not just relying on tools that you can find. You're actually like Adrian, just uh, making blink scripts or whatever he wants. So, or, you know, you, you know what you want and you're able to craft that specifically. And I think that's, Sort of the progression so like you don't necessarily if that's not something you're interested in you don't necessarily need to learn it but um it it helps a lot if you want custom made stuff for yourself yeah i think a really important part of what you can do as an artist is, is not just like you'll be doing tools or anything just like being able to search google for something that might work for you and then just be able to just change this word this other word and and turn yeah, it that's into, my python ability right there yeah like, like <laughs> yeah, you know you, you yeah. need to like change something on 100 read notes or something like that or i don't know and and whenever it comes to the, like building templates and and stuff that actually you know but it, it's yeah. like another ability at the end it's like there's so many things and you just find the, the ones that you enjoy my main suggestion especially for juniors and people starting out would be don't think that you can forget the creative or the technical part both are super important and whichever you are less strong in, uh, you still need to, you know, take care yeah. of that uh, because in the end you'll be limited by the other one. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's one of the things I tell people um, that ask about my job that don't know anything about VFX. I always just say like the type of minds that I meet uh, in VFX, it's like the perfect crossroads between technical and creative. And, you know, you can't really be too much without the other one and you can't be more technical. Like, you know, you have to be this balanced, sort of thing and, and yeah uh, as josh was saying um which different on every show yeah, as well right just don't... like some shows demand you be more creative and then yeah. some shows like you're doing super it might look like a very simple shot but technically it's a pain in the ass to do so it's i, I, th I find you generally cross between i guess actually a question i got for like tone is because i learned blink scripts a little while ago of chris fryer's thing and i made this kind of blink script tool and i got really good at it and now I just haven't used it and I've just forgotten everything. And I bet if I look, and I spent kind of like 30 minutes before work every morning for, I don't know, like a month like learning and 
Another thing as well, actually, it's quite useful to learn Python and Blink script. Go on Nukepedia, download all the tools that you use, and then just go through the Blink script in Python and then just mm. like break apart and see which what section does. And then I found it quite easy because then you think of each section like a node, almost like Nuke, because your brain's already working that way and you can connect it in. But like my question for you guys is, I forgot all those skills because I don't use them. How do you kind of like keep like keep keep going with it and keep remembering it if you're not using it so much at work? Do you just set yourself side projects? Is that what you're doing? Oh, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I think you just sort of, <laughs> you just sort of either remember it or I, I know this sounds really, really <laughs> silly. Coming from me, it sounds silly, but like I, I almost never key anymore. And I'm like, everybody knows me as like, oh, like a guy who he's just keying. But like, if if I, sometimes I forget what I even what I even said, I'm like, oh, I got to go remind myself and just watch, you know, a video or something. Oh, and yeah, it's, it's almost like a, a bookmark of what I knew in the past um, so that I can reference myself in some way or, or some website or something. And uh, so like, I guess that kind of answers. I mean, it's kind of a unique uh, answer, I suppose. But um, yeah, I, I you know, you just you remember some techniques and the fun, it's the fundamentals, right? It's like like you 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 remember the workflow of it. And it doesn't matter if the mm -hmm. tool changed. Like one of the, one of the big things is I, I use in paint now more because that didn't exist back in uh, whatever it was, the 2014 or so. And so now I'm like, oh, I could do that same thing. I'm just looking for a clean plate and I could just use in paint because it exists now and it's m much faster and better. So, I mean, this is a small example. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I guess like a really important thing is like you might forget, but then whenever you have to go back at it and, and instead of learning it again, you will already be That's in a true. better position. Like, it's like, I guess, whenever you do a sport and you stop doing it, then when you start, you, you will be way faster to catch up that than another person who never done, did it before. So that's one way, I, I guess. And and just like teaching it, like when, whenever anyone asks you for, for something and you, you have to explain it. For me, every year I'm forced to, you know, revisiting the basics and some things are like, hey, oh, that's true that you don't remember. And, and this other thing makes sense. And suddenly it's like, whoa, uh, I just learned something new from just trying to explain something really basic. So yeah, the, the teaching yeah. is the is the best way to learn, I mm -hmm. think, in, in my opinion. I mean, you really know where the holes in your understanding are when you start to explain it. And then you're like, oh, wait, I, I can't. Exp I don't know why this works. Or you, you think you know why it works. And then you try to explain to someone else and you see a blank look in their face. And you're like, OK, I didn't explain that very well. I must not. <laughs> I must not know what I'm talking. And then you got to go research and you got to find a better explanation of it um, where your holes are. Um, oh. No. oh, sorry. Oh, what? I just had a question for actually you guys. So what what drove you guys to teaching? As in like what what motivated you to be like, you know, I'm going to go like Adrian, you you teach um, students in, in real life as well as the like, courses online. And, and Josh, you have like a kind of a mentorship uh, program where you teach one on one. But what kind of drove you to want to do that? Uh, well, so, so for me, it was the fact that I, I've been teaching universities uh, since like the start of my career when I started MPC. And then you, I very quickly realized that like not all these courses are suited for everyone. And there's so many like different people in the industry that need different things. So like I taught someone who, I mean, like the extreme example of this is I taught this lady who had worked at DNA before Nuke was even a thing. She'd had kids and took some time off. And then in the pandemic, she needed to uh, get a job and Weta hired her. <laughs> and she hadn't used Nuke before. <laughs> and Weta hired her as a compo because she was a very good compo and had a great eye. It was like, right, I need to learn Nuke in X amount of time, super quick. I don't care about Reddit practice, I need to know it here. So that was, okay, you need a specific thing. And it was fun like designing it for her. And then you get other people that I've taught who are like mid compers. And actually, sometimes they don't, they need like one lesson and you look at their key and you're like, actually, you're like, you're a really good key. Like, sometimes it's a confidence thing. And they've had like some crappy soup who's made them feel crap about something. And they've got it in their head that they're a bit rubbish at something. And it's like, no, actually, like, you're really good. Here's a couple of things you need. And you only need one hour of training, right? And I think the pro the thing that I was kind of getting frustrated with is like, the people like that would be forced to do some sort of like 12 week, eight month course that costs thousands. And it's like, actually, you know what? Like, maybe you don't need that. Maybe you just need this particular thing. So, I think that's kind of why I started because I'd worked in the other ones and I just felt like, again, some university is good for some people and some courses are good for like the long courses are good for some people, but not everyone needs that. Um, so I guess that, that was for me why I started teaching. And also I felt like there wasn't enough people teaching who are actually in the industry. Like you see these people who kind of are teachers because they can't get a job as a compositor. 
And I felt like that kind of frustrated me a bit. So that's again, why I started teaching. Um, so, so those are the main, the main two uh, reasons why I started teaching. Um, yeah. How about you, How about you Adrian? I guess I just enjoy it in general. Like uh, I, I, I have many times just the feeling like, oh, I just found this thing. Like, I guess the, the way you, uh, you, Tony, um, take it out of your system is by, you know, making a cool video and publishing so that everyone can benefit from it. Uh, I guess it's, you know, a reflection of the same thing. Uh, I just like enjoy a lot just making stuff click in, in, in people that I can see, look at their faces mm -hmm. and be like, hey, you're just understanding something and, and, and kind of getting that, you know, mood and... I think that's like such a nice thing and, and just being able to like share everything, like not put any sort of limits to wh where you drive the, 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 yeah, the lesson or whatever. And yeah, I also started like a few years ago doing some mentoring as well, just reduce groups of, of people with more experience. I think that was also like a way to get to more technical stuff that may maybe with starters, it's like a little bit overkill <laughs> to cover. Um, I think it's just like sharing stuff is never bad for you. I would say that's like a really key thing. And I feel like you, some people are like I mean, afraid of, of sharing stuff and it's like right the opposite. Like mm -hmm. I got so much. I think know, actually that's stuff. one thing, right? Like the, the more you teach, the more you realize that you like that. I think when I started teaching, I got a bit of kickback from some mids and seniors because they were like, oh, you're going to flood the industry with juniors. But I think the more you teach, the more you realize that is just not the case. And like you can teach someone how to do something properly, but it's just iterations of that over and over again. They got to do it on this, like let's say keying and edges. Okay, you got to do it on this plate. And now the plate's crazy lit and all this emotion blur. And you realize actually that you can't just learn this thing in a month. Right, like that. That's kind of the thing, and you get less worried about it. Sorry, Adrian. What were you gonna say? Yeah, no, no. You know, I, I literally uh, made a blog post about that, and I, I was planning to publish it like tomorrow, so I might just do it. It was literally on on, oh, on like teaching and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people so, think that it's just gonna go out into the void, and that you, like nobody's gonna look at it. Um, but you know, I think it's a way. Like if you if you know, um, uh, as Adrian was saying, because he knows me, um, and we've talked about it before. Like I get really. It's almost like I'm frustrated with stuff that I learn yeah. either over the years or while at work. I'm like, why didn't I know that before? Like people know this stuff and I can't find it. But until until it happens or until I meet the right person and they say like, oh, yeah, just do this little trick. And I get really frustrated. And I'm like, well, somebody needs to say it. And it's like it's, it has to be me that I have to say it. Then I guess like it has. To, and I feel I feel sort of uh, this anxiety that it's like exists only in my head. And that's what Adrian was saying. Like, I want to put it out, like, because I, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that, like, it only existing, like, in my head or, you know, in several people's heads. But maybe they don't want to make a video or something like that. Which, um, which is kind of the point of this uh, talk is like sharing. Like, people aren't going to steal your ideas. Like, um, people are going to recognize you as like somebody who knows things, and it, they're never going to empty your head of techniques <laughs> and concepts or tools. Like, there's uh, too many layers of, of like complexity below what you can you know absorb in a single sitting it's like you just need to explore yourself through so many yeah times and and that's like actually one i think really nice point and something that reminded me of you know something that i admire a lot from you two guys that you really started both of you sharing stuff when you were like you know not even seniors or anything you just like felt the need to you know share stuff and other videos or newsletter or whatever like you've always been sharing so mm -hmm. much and I think the community like appreciates you a lot for that. So I think that to... kind of makes it fun, right? Because you can see what we were sharing as juniors v seniors, and maybe like our focal point shifted slightly. And I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, Tony, how about you? Like, how do you pick what topics you work on, right? Because obviously, there's probably a ton of stuff in your head that you want to make videos on. You've got a limited amount of time. Yeah. But how do you even pick which topic? Do you just hit the one you think is going to needed to be hit the most, or what do you do? Yeah, it's um, very specifically actually. It's it's when I when I know uh, something about a topic or a technique. And I, I and I literally don't see it anywhere else. Um, so I'm, I'm doing. A, I'm, I don't like to repeat stuff that's already been said before. I, yeah. I think people, some people teach stuff like, uh, and I'm like, oh, that's great. Like it's already been said, and there's nothing more that I can contribute to that topic. But one of the things I'm covering right now is CG CG compositing, and I did a lot of research, like looking at the internet. Um, and I, I looked at several tutorials and I, you know, I didn't go on every paid site or anything to go download everything to, to do like, oh, did they teach this yet? But everything, at least that I could Google, I was like, you know what? I know a lot of stuff about this subject that I don't see out there. 
and then I and I feel like okay, I I can probably share something. So it's more like yeah. there's a void that that I think that I could fill or that I could add something to that area. Um, and so that's generally and and also like um, topics that interest me, like like things that I just find really fascinating. I mean, um, something I'd add to that is like even if you like everyone can add something in their own voice and like i think going back to what adrian was saying about teaching like i re what i really love about teaching is iterating on the way i explain something to make it easier to understand the next time like the amount of time so the best way to explain a shuffle node i found is a chest of drawers with bits of paper in it and then you literally take the bit of paper out and put it in another drawer that's a different channel right <laughs> and it's like slowly you start learning all these different ways and improving how you're going to explain it to your next lot of students and I think that coming back to, I think Tony's obviously right. Like you're trying, he's trying to fill a void, but sometimes if you're a junior, you might be better explaining things to junior artists who are in the same situation as you. And if you've got a particular way of explaining that one thing, like the pre mole or whatever it is, those little topics that are a little tricky to get the hurdle over to get over at first. Like, I think it's worth making a short two, three minute video. Right. And as me and Tony say, and sometimes this stuff comes up, comes up in 10 years and you find it on someone's blog. But I think, as you say, like if you've got a unique way of explaining something that makes sense to X amount of people at work, maybe then just write it down or uh, put it online somewhere. And just, yeah, I think, I think sharing is super important. So don't feel like you have to come up with this or I've got to come up with a super fresh idea that no one else has ever thought about. Um, yeah. yeah some, I sometimes think, I just a, a different analogy. Yeah. Like you said, like yeah. just breaking it down. And like if you hear something and you didn't get it the first time and you, you, and then somehow you process it a few days later and you're like oh so it's it's sort of like this uh, and you'll and, and you've used a different analogy and whatever you whatever you've done to to understand it better then you could say that to the next person yeah. and maybe they are thinking a little bit more like you um and, and then they'll understand it a little bit quicker uh than the original like i, I don't know like adrian or, or josh like how you approach um coming up like with the courses because you have to kind of like pre lay out like some courses and how do you find like yeah. do you do you adjust like oh that didn't that didn't get understood very well do i do i make it again and do i like make, find it another analogy with this it's like being a comedian man you know like a comedian will literally like prepare and then you go and then the stuff that gets laughed at the most you keep and the stuff that doesn't it's literally that like it's literally that i think and you get an idea of right this this didn't click with this class and this did etc the nut the most nuts one i came up with was to get people king, I started a thing called Bohemian Rhapsody King, right? Which is where you play Bohemian Rhapsody, which is about eight or nine minutes long in the lesson, in the class with everyone, and they've got to get some edges and some keys done in that time to an okay standard of this thing. So you start like just coming up with these random things and just throwing them out there and trying and to see what actually sticks with people. Um, I think the best person for that, if I'm honestly that I look up to, is like Richard Feynman. I think he was very good at like... Um, uh, kind of explain things in a very simple way and working up from from basics <clears throat> so i get take from him quite a lot um and a few other kind of aspects but I, I find that's the thing i have to prepare for most when i make a tutorial i always want to make them as short as possible so it's right how can i get this information in a super easy way that will be a, anyone will be able to pick up ideally in this way and that's kind of the challenge for me is less about finding the topic and more about Okay, how can I explain this in the most elegant way possible? And that's the fun bit for me personally. Yeah, I think I think it's awesome. Um, I guess it's the same for me actually. Like I've just been like teaching for like, four years, like the, the same topics, like just all the basics of compositing and stuff. And at first, it was just like a, you know a list of stuff. I would like to cover this. And at first, I was just a comper. I was not a, a formal a formal teacher or, or anything. So I was just like you know <laughs> going on so many topics and not understanding what like the the, the speed at which a normal brain that is not used to compositing is able to you know process mm -hmm. stuff and and that takes like practice and stuff but as long as you enjoy it and and people see that you enjoy it i think that's a really big component of it um you kind of sharing the passion i think and at least in my personal thing like for example with the python thing like i've been teaching it for like four years so so i, I was not convinced for the first times and i'm like okay maybe now i kind of know what works best and and that happens, like I guess, for for anything you do, right? You just need to find a way to iterate over whatever you're doing and, and be able to make it better. If 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 anything stays as it is, it's just not good enough. I mean, stealing from other industries is awesome as well. For that, like, uh, I made a tutorial for the founder recently, which is a beginner's tutorial, and the whole idea of it is that you start with a finished new script, 
And then you basically have to like do some client changes, which are creative notes. They're not tech checks. Like you do the creative notes and the fun bit once it's already set up. And that was actually nicked from a chess player called Josh Waitskin. And the, how he started, and he was like one of the best chess players in the world. And how he started out was he basically, his tutor made him have king, play against a king. And then he just had a pawn. And it was basically end game, like end, end game of chess. So that was the idea with that. Like, so you can just come up with ideas from every other industry as well. Um, so that, that's, again, something else that you can grab the best ideas from these other industries and use them to enhance the VFX industry. And yeah. You can learn really useful things for compositing from like playing tennis. Like, like it's such yeah. a, a crazy thing how, how, how much, you know, interconnected everything is in terms of knowledge and explaining stuff. Mm. You don't need so, to wait till, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, we're actually running out of time. Um, but I'm curious to yes, ask like a final question, kind of like as a wrap up, if that, that, that's okay. Um, is there any lesson that you learned the hard way that you could, you could give any advice to, to other people to avoid it? I mean, for me, it's that one that I overworked stuff as a junior. Like I think, uh, having the seniority and the maturity to daily something maybe, and don't really play around with the lighting too much and say, right, this is actually what the lighting looks like. These are the issues I think I found. Da, 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 da. This is what I think I would do to fix those. Do you want me to do it in comp or do you want the lighter to do it? Um, or maybe have a first pass and go into someone else's new script that's got a shot like yours and make sure your lighting matches there. So that that's mine, like that I learned the hard way. Like, I was overworking stuff as a junior on the first version. Um, I did get first version final island though because of that. So uh... <laughs> <laughs> all, the other, all the other times didn't work so well in my favor. Um, Tony, Adrian? I, I would say something along the lines of like, uh, don't try to put a bandaid on top of a bandaid, like tr try to do, do something correctly like the first time, even if it takes a little bit more time, uh, because you might start building a nuke script and then it gets messier and messier and messier. And then, and then eventually you can't even open it or you don't even know what you did. And so like, always keep it like, like it, it might take you a bit more time, but in you're helping your future self of like, Okay, keep it organized. Uh, in a, in two months, if I open this again, will I know what I was doing? If I have to share, if I have to give this to somebody, so it's sort of like knowing when some like taking a little bit more time and thinking about it, like maybe thinking about what you're about to do um, before you do it. Like sometimes I I draw out like an outline of like oh I need to put this layer here and there, and and sort of like like just to, just see if I understand like what I need to. Uh, be doing so yeah i think it's really important like on one side to to be aware that um your node graph is going to be read or seen m many more times that than you're writing it or creating it so so that's like a really important thing just work as if your node graph is also a part of your company not just something in the background and also work in, in a way that you can be uh, asked to change literally anything. The, the thing that you expect the least and the thing that you hate the most and that you would not want to change, just work in a way that you will be able to change it still because that's, that's yeah. kind of the essence of... of it's know. always the thing as well, isn't it? That you like cheated a little bit on and it's like, oh, the client picked that one thing I cheated on my new script. Like, oh. <laughs> it's, uh, and you learn, that the, you learn that the hard way, right? A couple of times a junior and then you just don't do it anymore, basically. Um, yeah. So for, uh, actually, for me, the, the lesson I think the most important one for you know, my past self or something would be communication. So every time I was not sure uh, whether I had to communicate something or not, and I ended up communicating it, 100% of times it was the right choice, 100%. And it was many times. So um, yeah, I think that's a really important part of, of this job, just being able to, you know, communicate. Even more so when you're working remote, like I'm, lead, I'm leading my students at the moment at work and it is, you need that even more when you're remote because you can't just look around and see what someone's working on or, or catch something. So yeah, communication is super useful. Great, amazing. Thank you very much. Um, I think that we're running out of time. Well, we're five minutes away actually. So um, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you everyone in the chat and especially thank you Jos, Adrian, and, and Tony uh, for being here. Uh, we will be having a different session every th Thursday of the month. So the next one will be with Victor Perez on April 20th. So I'll hope to see you all there again. Um, thanks again uh, to the three of you. And yeah, have a good evening. I have to say our community is great. <laughs> In New York, it's uh, an amazing one.
Thanks.